Pennsylvania doing advanced heart failure. I met this gentleman, Jim, at a recent clinic visit, uh, and uh, it's great to be invited to talk with uh, patients and people that are interested in, in, uh, in, the, in, in the organ, uh, organ donation and in the ability to uh, treat patients with single organ and double organ dysfunction with, with, with organ transplant. And I'm the current director of the Mechanical Assist Device Program. I'm going to talk about mechanical assistance of the heart and try to really weave it with transplant so folks understood what its role is. And, and I'm glad it's a small group so we can make this uh, not a boring monologue, but more of a really integrated uh, discussion. All right, at this point, I'm going to turn the lights down so we get a better shot of that. But anytime you step back, we're going to get a better view of you under the light, but it picks up pretty good. Thank you, Chaz. So, you know, I, <clears throat> in choosing a title, I just want you guys to know what the role of mechanical assist device therapy is in bridging patients to heart transplantation. And also, this concept of resting the heart, what, what it entails, how can it help someone potentially be healthier as they're awaiting transplant. And also, in the case of some patients, and I'll talk about a case or two, because it, it is of interest to Anyone who is in the organ transplant field knows that anybody that receives a transplant is given a gift to live while somebody else may not have it. So, so that, that has to be totally understood as a, uh, as a uh, you know, it's not totally true in every single case. In case of kidney transplant recipients, there's, you know, there's ongoing dialysis and maybe even other ways to recover. Uh, and stigma disease, but, but what I'm, what I'm going to present is also how we try to recover patients and keep them from being transplanted, in some cases, to allow them to uh, live longer and give somebody else a chance now with that transplant, and also live longer without transplantation and maybe even have more longevity overall, um, you know, if they do need transplant in the future. So I'll talk about this concept of recovery, resting the heart, allowing the heart to get better with the bad, the particular assist device. And please interrupt me if we have any uh, any questions, any anything technical, anything personal or technical or otherwise, just interrupt me. So I just want to be on the same page about what population we're talking about. Um, you know, we're talking about end-stage heart failure patients. And the end-stage, when it's applied to heart failure, always brings up, you know, memories of when you apply that term. There were times when we thought somebody was not going to be better with medicine, and then beta blockers came along, a certain type of medicine, and they started recovering. And there are patients that were told 10 years ago, I see them, that you needed a transplant 10, 12 years ago, but then you're not in cancer. So, I mean, and then they get the beta blocker or some other therapy, and they're alive later. So either their physicians were completely off target as far as their need for transplantation, or more importantly, the medicines had a role in, in recovering them to a degree that nobody probably expected, and they, and they were able to, to survive. But what we are talking about now that we have, we don't have stem cells to help us recover hearts yet. We hope we will in the next 10 years. But right now we're talking about a pretty solid base of medicines that we all accept that everybody needs to be trialed on in order to get better. And if you fail that, then you move forward as a, an advanced heart failure patient. And if you see this, this red line here is, is survival over time. And then obviously, what, what, when you get to a functional capacity, of class four, meaning you can barely do anything at home, then then your survival is very much in question, and it's a matter of months. And that correlates with hospitalizations in the blue line. And when I say that, it's inversely correlated, more hospitalizations, less survival. Now, if you look at this, this is a very tight correlation that we observe as clinicians. When somebody's doing less, it always worries me when I'm following my patients, especially the patients that are younger that have so much reserve often, when they say, well, I'm still walking a mile, but I was doing two miles 10, you know, 10 months ago, six months ago when I saw you last, that, that's a signal that something else, that something could be going on. The, you know, the heart's not able to, to support that patient enough. I'm not saying you need to transplant at that time if you're walking a mile, but what I'm saying is something's going on and, and, then, and then they can actually slip off this curve. So does that make sense? This is what we're talking about as a patient that no matter no matter how many medicines you pour on them, they're still failing. And I tell my, my colleagues and I tell you know the residents that I teach and the fellows, 
The best heart failure is a simple definition. When you run out of medicines and you need more myocytes, more, more muscle cells, that's the definition of advanced heart failure. Because that's, that's what we're talking about. They need advanced therapies. And so here's the ladder of all these therapies we talked about, all these medicines, and then we have some pacemakers that can help. We have, um, we have a uh, multidisciplinary team, a nurse practitioner with the physician teaming up with the patient to really make sure that the, the patient's volume and the patient's water status is intact. And then we got this, you know, keep climbing up this ladder and then you're here being considered for transplant. Or this is what, again, tonight's topic will be briefly, uh, would you remind me, we have about, is it about an hour? As much time as you want. Okay. Usually an hour and a half with question and answers is like okay, the so an hour and we can no rush at all. leave open the discussion, but I'd rather have you guys interrupt me and, we, and then I'll smooth it over an hour and a half this, these slides. are not that many, it's about 35, 40. So, so transplant and that, what is a VAT? A ventricular assist device. What, it's exactly what it's, what it's termed to be. It's an assist device that allows a heart to rest, pumps blood to the body and allowing it to, um, you know, to survive and to be supported longer um, with the other function of the heart still there. The heart still has other functions, endocrine and other, for and other functions. So you're not replacing the heart, as opposed to total artificial heart, you're not replacing the heart, you're assisting the heart. And obviously hospice is, is, is where you, you know, again, I would put hospice, you know, the slide's probably just trying to make the case that you consider this and you're left with this, but I'd put hospice sometimes at this level too. In other words, there are patients and you guys know some of these patients, uh, some of these colleagues that, I mean, uh, friends, uh, patients that you may have known in, um, in the floors where you were hospitalized, maybe even friends, that uh, they just were not candidates in terms of what it takes to have a benefit from these therapies. And it takes a lot. Uh, and you guys went through this, uh, those that have gone through transplant. It takes a lot. And, and thank goodness we choose people right because it, it's a gift and more importantly, um, uh, you know, there, there's there's a lot for the patient's sake as well to undergo surgery and then say, you know, I want to do well. I want to want to walk out of this hospital. I don't want to be wheeled out of this hospital. I want to walk out of this hospital. And I want to do what I couldn't do before. So that's the sort of, you know, this is just sort of a very composite of those same steps. You know, you optimize medical therapy. You try to consider valve surgery in some cases. I don't think this works. Valve surgery when the valve. The valves are leaky because the heart's so big. This doesn't really work. Uh, investigational drugs, I mean, what are we talking about here? Um, certain trials were investigating and stage heart failure patients and trying to see if they could get better um, with medicines and the safety, obviously, in a, in a safe, safe environment. And this has not really panned out. Um, this is a pacemaker that I talked about. When, when all this fails, then, then you have these options here, transplant bags. This, this, this option of inotropes, what are these? These are medicines that make the heart work more in order to supply the body with more blood flow. And they don't rest the heart, they, they make the heart work more. So think of the VAD, the assist device, as a way to get more blood flow to the body, but, but the body's resting, I mean the heart's resting, as opposed to the inotropes, the heart's being driven uh, to work more uh, in, 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 in order to get to transplant, as a bridge to transplant. So why would you use inotropes instead of VAD? Great question. Did I email these questions to you guys? That's a great <laughs> question. Um, let me tell you, the belief when we were starting to support patients with assist devices, and I'm talking about long history here, 20, 25 years. So let's let's go to the meat of the of the time frame when it was that, not experimental, it was actually something that was much more seen as the standard of care to do so. But so let's say 10 years ago, why why were people still using inotropes? The hope was to get somebody to transplant with one surgery, not two. And maybe that would decrease their risk at transplant if you just had one sternotomy, one uh, operation in the chest, and not two. Um, secondly, the belief was that there were too many complications within the assist device. If there are complications, and I'm going to talk about some of those complications, absolutely. Thirdly, there was the issue of a center having enough experience to say they're better off with a bad. It, it's always harder to send a patient to surgery and to add a medicine and see how they do. The, the important thing to, to keep in mind is, now that we have much more data and more experience, we really believe that the inotropes really don't have a role sustaining people too long. And what's too long, it varies amongst patients, but if we, we talk about a kind of two to three week period. If we get a heart in two to three weeks, let's go for inotropic support, 
keep an eye on him like Buck. We often see him twice a week, once a week, admi at, at minimum twice a week. Or they're hospitalized, as we call a patient may be parked in the hospital, hospitalized because we want to keep monitoring everything, the fluid status, everything, the kidney function on their way to transplant. I've got a question. Yes, sir. Once a patient, once a patient, I get, I get to see after a lot. Once a patient is on a vat, yeah. how long do they have to wait to get a true transplant after they're put on a vat? When you are, now, remember there's two components here after a surgical operation. One is, you know, there's a whole issue of how is, how is the body recovering? Right. And I'm talking about the issue of, you know, when you're lying flat as a human being, you were never meant to be flat and flat. If you, if you take normal volunteers and you put them in bed for a week, guess how long it takes for them just to be back to their previous physical capacity? Just with their guesses. Three months. Six months. That's a good, that's a good start. Six months. So, so if you were to, it takes six months for them just to recover back to that previous, for one week. And you put them flat, you know, they go to the bathroom and get up, but they're mostly bed bound. So you got a patient with end-stage heart failure awaiting a, an operation. You can imagine the physical recovery that it takes. So we, I'd say at least a month for physical recovery. Also, you get the benefits of that bad because the chest is no longer congested. The kidneys are seeing more blood flow. I have a slide here which will also let you know that some patients who are deemed not eligible for transplant because they have, for example, too high pressure in the lung or the kidney function wasn't good enough, become transplant eligible on the VAD because those indices get better. So the VAD does heal the body in the in a select number of patients, which is becoming increasing. I mean, it used to be, as when I say select, when we started with assist devices, we were talking about a mortality rate, preoperative mortality or 30 mortality rate of at least 35%. Now we're talking under 10%. I mean, that's 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 becoming more palatable, especially when you're when you're saying, well, got it. What's the mortality rate with transplant? You have to understand it's still an operation. If you're very sick going into transplant, you may not come out of transplant patient alive. You may not even come out that day alive, but the more important thing is what happens in the next 30 days. What, you know, the recovery. Of all organs, especially the person's, uh, also the person's recovery in terms of their, their willingness to get up, walk, and start doing more each day. So I say a month. The answer to your question is we wait at least a month. We never try to turn somebody around two or three weeks because they just had an operation. I mean, you want them to at least have their chest, you know, get stronger and uh, and fuse at least, and, and and then you know wait for that to to happen. Um, some of us really believe that if someone had more like two to three months out of that, and the key is to get them home. I mean, we want we we just sent a patient home after two weeks after her bad bridge, and she's recovering. She's a bridge to transplant. She'll be a long bridge to transplant because she still has used tobacco recently, so we're going to be awaiting her proof that she can really, you know, be without tobacco. It's important to her. It's, it's, it's an absolute health risk, we all know, it, and, and it's important for us as transplant physicians to keep that as, as an absolute rule. So so it'll be for her about six months, and she, she's happy right now. I mean, you know, she's, she's much better, and, and she wants to get back to doing things. I don't know if she'll go back to work uh, because, you know, the turnaround, you know, back to another operation in six months and that transition, but, but at least you'll get to do some things. Does that, does that so actually so mean so that so basically what you're saying is every patient's going to be different. Right. There, is a, there is an but At least a month, at least a month. Okay. We, we really, we don't activate anybody. Um, and the way you activate somebody, by the way, depends on their, on their blood, uh, on, their, um, on their blood type. Uh, you try to say, well, gosh, they're such a good blood type. Let's, let's see how they do as a 1B. And the status 1B, which is sort of a, you know, high but not the ultimate status for transplant. And, and they make it transplanted as a 1B. Every bad patient that gets activated starts at 1B. Without any, without any other support, every bad patient starts at 1B. So that's why it's important for people to understand the other answer your question about anotropes. If you're a blood type O, it's hard to get you to transplant with anotropes alone. And, um, and again, you know, because the assist device gives you maybe a little more stability. Mm -hmm. you, you could wait as a no longer as a 1B. And every VAT patient also has a 30-day period that's called a grace period, 1A. And that's their period. That's, that could be, and that can be saved if there's a complication from the VAT. Or if the team elects because they have other patients waiting that have been waiting longer, you'd say, I'm going to put this person, you know, I'm going to hold their 1A status a little longer because they're well and they're healing with their VAT and it's to their advantage not to get transplanted in a week. You know, does that make sense? Or is that absolutely. absolutely. Now, this is a this figure I put up because you know this is a survival figure with transplantation. What 
I want everybody to be aware of this, especially in this room has been transplanted. You know, this steep drop, the first month, two months post-transplant is very real. When you walk out of the hospital with a heart transplant, you, I mean, again, you've already succeeded to, to a great degree. Um, it's not horribly steep. It's not like it doesn't come down to 50%. This is survival here. So, so, so what is that? This is, by the way, throughout different eras to show you a little bit of like, you know, we've learned something to try to get people more safely through transplant and better. But, but that is really about how sick you go into transplant. Because as you guys know more than anyone, it's about a single organ being transplanted, maybe a double organ to help in the cases of some patients. But you can't transplant every organ. You know, you can only do so much. So if the other organs are injured going into transplant, that's a very real, that's a really very real loss of life here. And, and we sometimes don't guess right who has more advanced liver injury, who has more advanced kidney injury that may require dialysis, which compromises the outcome of that patient immediately post. My reason for putting up this figure, just so you guys know, that our, our goal is to definitely get people out of the, you know, out of the box, get them out and, and doing well. So, so the ventricular assist devices play a role at least to help that process of healing the other organs to get somebody really, really more ready for transplant if they're not. Does that make sense? So, so that's, that's, that's sort of the purpose of that figure. Those statistics, yeah. are they only from people who died as a complication of their heart transplant? This is everything. This or is everything. everything. So if you're killing yes. an automobile accident, you count as dying as Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And again, because it's, you know, because the, the life of the person goes along with the life of that organ, or that organ mm -hmm. you know, again, the, the long term, you know, uh, long-term survival is definitely a lot more dependent on the, on the graft function. A lot of this early stuff, again, I go back to it, very little of this is due to graft dysfunction, acute early graft dysfunction, acute heart graft dysfunction. Yes. Just a uh, question. Yeah. It, it's always surprised me that with the advances in so many different directions <coughs> that the number, the survival yeah. rates haven't changed that significantly yeah. over time. That's a very good point. Is it just because really so many people get transplanted late in life and therefore they have a lifespan independent of the heart transplant? I'll tell you my opinion. I think that, um, I think that when you have to take immune suppression in order to sustain the life of that graft, uh, we know when there's, there's experimental animal models of transplantation that if you transplant a heart and a liver together. You may induce tolerance so that that heart can live a long, long time in that animal model without any medicines. And why do I talk about the medicines? What's wrong with the medicines? Well, the medicines can obviously affect the kidney function in humans long term. The medicines also, paradoxically, in the animal models, the medicines also cause some of that coronary disease in the graft long term that, and this has never been proven in humans because we can't, we can't certainly take away the medicine. I mean, you know, you have rejection facing you as an immediate risk. But if you look at these, these, these uh, animal models, the, the, the animals that don't get the calcium inhibitors, the prograph or the cyclosporins. You know, cyclosporin is the reason why we, we, we've been talking in this room today. I mean, you got to know that. The whole story of transplantation with Don Shumway, it's the only reason we're in this room tonight is because cyclosporin saved the day. Without it, I, I don't know if this country would have moved forward with three more transplants. And the leaders back in the 80s and 70s would have, and there was a few people that said, yes, the majority were like, we shouldn't do this. This is just not working. And, and they were wrong. <laughs> you know, Dr. Schumer was right, they were wrong, and now we're here tonight. But I can tell you that um, the, the issue of how to induce tolerance to allow human beings to be transplanted without medicine is huge. That's a Nobel Prize winning effort, and more importantly, it's a real, real graspable benefit for our patients if we could achieve that. So I do think it's, it's the life of that graft. It's, it's that we're, we're stuck kind of saying, how can we minimize immunosuppression enough so that we don't have rejection and also preserve the life of that long-term graft from these side effects of the, of the medicine that, by the way, are poorly understood. It's not understood why the organs that get immunosuppression have some more long-term vasculopathy. It's completely not understood. Yeah. Today, I mean, we go back and we know members of our support groups who back in the 90s weren't even eligible for a heart transplant because they were 55 years old and that was too old. Right. Today, 
many more people in their 50s, 60s, and even 70s are getting heart transplants, which take away the transplant and everything else, yeah. they'd still have a lifespan which is significantly less than the person who gets it at the age of 20. Yes. Do you think that those patients getting a transplant at later on, is, what, what's the average age of a transplant recipient receiving a heart? Maybe that would be the answer yeah. because if that's moved out, it then lifespan, I'm sorry? It has moved up, you're absolutely right. It has moved out later. Well, that would certainly affect this, wouldn't it? I think it could. I think it could. I think, um, you know, I think what you want to do is maybe do a model where you take age as a variable and then you adjust it and you could see that, that data. I could tell you that it's interesting, you know, we, we are always worried about a much older person being transplanted for reasons not so much of long-term longevity. We, we want them to get that, of course. Yeah. But we also want them to do well without cancer the first five years. I mean, we just don't want, I mean, p patients that are older are more susceptible to cancer. And then the suppression brings out that cancer. Mm -hmm. So we definitely, we definitely have that issue. I can tell you that, having said that, heart failure ages patients as well. <laughs> Chronic heart failure makes you age physiologically. We all know that. Um, it's well studied. And if you have somebody who's older who just has had heart failure for one year but now is truly dying of that, is that patient maybe physiologically a younger age? I mean, do we have the answer? Could we, could we do a biopsy of some organ and see how old? The way I size it up as a clinician, because we, we, we don't have all the answers, the way I size it up, if I, and we just had a patient who we transplanted at, at Huff who is uh, 68 years old. And the decision was made that for a quality of life point of view, this person had no other dysfunction. He had the kidneys of a 19-year-old, totally wonderful, normal functioning kidneys. He had no, not much heart failure. He was just dying of constant arrhythmias and getting shocked like 20 times a day. And so, and so basically there was no quality of life. This guy had no quality of life. And uh, there was, and he'd been through every procedure to try to get these shocks controlled. Everything, because we always do that. We try to absolutely make sure that the last resort, which is transplant, is the last resort. And in this guy's case, I mean, he went through ablation after ablation, two surgeries. And uh, a week later, he's walking around, still not smiling. He's still waiting to get shot with his new heart. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, that guy, so that guy, yeah. he's walking around a week later. He's yeah. 68. He looks yep. great. And so we guess right. I mean, I think he'll do well long term. Also, the other the other thing you got to consider, Jim, it's, it's interesting. There's this concept of immunosenescence, which means the immune system ages with time. So guess what? We know that older older people don't get rejection. No one here as much as the younger. So there you have the trade off. The older people get less okay. rejection. Maybe they're a little longer. Or maybe if you guess right, they're actually younger than you think. It is, I think, very hard. And when I say that, I I'm a big big believer in individualizing every single decision and also believe it in taking the person's wishes into account. If they've already, the only person's already talked about how they're going to die with their family. Yeah. I really don't think at that point telling a person, guess what, you can be transplanted. <laughs> I mean, I think at that point, that person's accepting a different course. And mm -hmm. if you're wrong on how they'll do post-transplant, you're going to be on their dartboard every day, and you should be, yeah. uh, because you've basically changed the uh, decision they've already come to. Yeah. I had my heart transplanted 18 months ago. I was 61. And I was still like young. Pardon me? That's young. I, huh, really? That's what I wanted to hear. No, I mean, I can tell you, I think, the, if you look at the bridge to transplant, I'll, I'll show you some data. The bridge to transplant trial with the HeartMate 2, the mean age was around 56. Mean. Wow. So they were putting HeartMates, these devices that I'll talk about, into patients that were as old as probably 65. And there was no cutoff. It was all up to the transplant center to decide if they were eligible for transplant based on their own criteria or lack thereof. <laughs> depending on how they thought about this question. Does that make sense? I mean, it, yep. it's, it's a very, I think this is a hard question. We could sit here all night, mm. and I could, you, you and I could change our mind. It's just interesting, right? Night, Those we, four colors lining up together are so close, yeah. it just surprised me. Yeah, yeah. But you said something earlier, though, about immunosuppressing drugs with older people. Oh, what I meant to so say. Are you, are you considering, at 61, I'm still I'm considered young? No, no, let me explain. So, so I. And I mean that. I think given the way we've shifted to transplanting older people, I think 61 is still a, you know, age that's not old. That's you not said that something about... Immunosenescence. Yes, it's still above less immunosenescence. Uh, we have never tested that with real studies, but I consider the, the patient above 60, or 55 even, has a much, much lower risk of rejecting the patient at 20 to 30. 
Yeah. Race plays a role, age plays a role. There's no question. And it makes sense. It's the, the immune system's variability. And, and, and I don't understand why the older persons, what, what part of the immune system gets less, is less sharp in reacting and, 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 and having rejection as a consequence. But I do know that some of the older patients that we transplanted, especially when, for example, little skin cancer pops up, we bring down the immune suppression and we still see zeros on their biopsy scores. Nothing. And, and we don't see that with the young. So there's no question, if it's well studied, we can maybe understand how, what the basis of that is, turn some of the younger people older <laughs> for, that, for that benefit. But I, but I can tell you that there's no question that rejection is not a reason but that we see older people dying in country. It just isn't. So, I mean, more importantly with, with transplant, I mean, this is the key thing, right? I mean, no limitation of physical activity. Well over, I mean, look at this. This is one year, three years, five years. You know, you only, you see a blip that made a little change in uh, seven years. I mean, this is the red where people basically say, well, I can do everything I want. No, there's no doubt everything I want. Now, this is pretty remarkable when you think about one thing. If, if you actually look at, you know, the medicines you're on and the, um, and, and, the, and the fact that the heart has been implanted and, and the nerves are cut and deinnervated, it's not like as if you woke up suddenly without surgery with a perfect match in your heart. I mean, you had to undergo a surgical procedure with medicines to sustain that graft and you're deinnervated. And people still say, I can do everything I want before. If you try to measure physical capacity in a transplant patient, it's not normal. It's, it's below normal. But people still feel, and I think the reason this, this holds true is because they were so sick pre-transplant. I mean, if you just if you just have any idea, which none of us who aren't well who aren't afflicted with this have, but if you take care of a patient, you have an idea of the fact that they they can't do much pre-transplant. They say I can do anything, just about anything I want post-transplant. That leads to a different question, and, yeah. and as I thought about it, I realized how different the question really was. There uh, we go. Um, I was surprised a number of years ago, coming back from the U.S. transplant games, to hear somebody claim that heart transplant patients are pretty much disabled. And I said, no way. And they said, New York team said their experience is like 80% of heart transplant patients remain on the disability list. And I said, I can't believe that. Yeah. So I went to social workers at Health at the time, and I said, no, I can't believe this, but what's your experience? He said, that's higher than we'd like to see it. It's in the 75 to 80% range. Disabled. Disabled, and I said, well, "Why can that be?" Well, I didn't realize at the time that I was associating with groups like we have here, where Chad is back to work, Dan's back to work, and back to work, and we thought that was normal. And so I took that on as a challenge, and we went to do something about it. But given what you're telling us here, no activity limitations, and I realize there's other the factors. The city, these are people like you know filling out a report in clinic. And, right. and with data from you know, this is, this is the what, thing. what would you say is your experience with heart transplant patients after a year out? What percent remain on the disability list? Well, I came from San Francisco. UCSF was my previous job. I was there five years. Prior to that, I was at Hopkins training for another five years. I do think it really varies. It's very interesting. In, in, in San Francisco, there was, there was a culture, I at least felt this, with the patients that were mine who wanted bads, because I was fighting an uphill battle in San Francisco to try to make sure assist devices were actually part of the bridge to transplant um, mechanism. It seems as an option. It doesn't mean that that is what you have to do, but it's got to be an option, <laughs> given how much work has been done and given how well some people do. So the majority of the people that we felt were great candidates were the ones that were motivated to get out of the hospital and go back to work because they could be at work waiting for their heart transplant. And that's legitimate because they have a VAT. And that VAT is not perfect. Uh, it can fail over time, so it's, it's legitimate to put them on a transplant list and make that make them and turn them into patients that are without a VAT and still supportive of the transplant only. Um, I don't have this I don't have stats Jim, from UCSF, but I did at least my coordinators, I remember Andrew well from Connell, would always raise the issue at the time of meeting the patient. And you know, I want to make sure he knows about this vocational service that redirects, pay, I mean, because he wants to go back to work. I said, that's great. So I, I was used to a little bit, I, mean, I don't know if it's an east-west East -west thing. I don't know if Maybe you should do that study. Is it an east-west coast thing? Is the east coast a little too uh, My is on the east coast I have no idea, but, but I can tell you the push was very much, and I remember meeting the transplant coordinator from Stanford, same thing. There was a real questioning of, well, gosh, they've been transplanted for three, six months. 
What do I do? <laughs> you know, I mean, what did they do before? Because the assumption is, oh, I couldn't go back to my previous job because I have a heart condition. Well, you have a heart transplant that is fully supporting you with the need to care for it. So maybe if you're doing high risk work and working 16 hours a week and you have no time to take your medicines, absolutely right. don't get back to work with that job. And it may be you have, a, you have a compromise, yeah. I think it's insurance too. A lot of people now that's there's a lot of other factors. People I'm still trying trying to stay on disability list because of the insurance yeah. angle of things. Okay. You know? But isn't that sad to some degree that there can't be some Well I mean if yeah. you, you can't you know if you work part time you're gonna end up Yeah. Maybe two hundred dollars a week. You're going to end up. You roll your your your, your floor, right? right your baseline. So and then, yeah, you that came up, by the way. That, that yeah. definitely came up in the decision with some patients. And then mm -hmm. you know, the, the, how many jobs nowadays have benefits? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Full time mm -hmm. benefits and walk and and come in as uh, you know. I've been out of work for a couple of years. <laughs> Why? Yeah. 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 You, also, you also said something earlier. It, it hit me home. Because I remember when I was evaluated for my part with the doctors at Penn, my lead doctor said to me, you've been sick. I asked her how would I feel after the fact. And she said, you've been sick for so long, you don't know what it's good to, you don't know what it feels like to feel good. And now I've had the heart transplant and I w wonder, is this what good feels like? I understand. <laughs> I guess my wake up call was going back for an annual and went to do the stress test, you filled out a document, you know, your history. And there was a part in there about your cardiac history, and I filled it out, of course. And the nurse came over to review it, and she got that second, she says, oh, not with this heart, you didn't cross it all out. And I thought, wow, that's right, that's passive, it's no longer a factor. With this heart, you don't have any of those conditions, so the history was gone. I mean, it changed the whole perception of things. It was an amazing uh, experience, very different from the one uh, other friend who went to get their x-ray through annual and the x-ray technician says, wow, you've had a heart transplant. She says, yeah. You know, these things only last seven years. Oh! <laughs> I mean, <Yeah. laughs> the medical professor is going to do an awful lot with creating expectation one way or the other. <laughs> Luckily, she was involved in a group like this and she knew he that that was... He gave you the bad data with that figure, but that's fine. Yeah. You know... Well, this is back in the early 90s, too. The other issue is how you do if you go back to work with a heart transplant. I think that's a more salient issue. It would be nice if it can be studied there's a huge confounder because, of course, the people that are back to work are the ones that are actually probably doing well without rejection. But I'll bet you you could do a study very early on. The people that went early, within six months, back to some vocational volunteer or vocational activity that was a passion or just, or just something they wanted to do just because they believe in work. I'll bet you there's an outcome difference. I, I just know it. Mm -hmm. uh, I just know that if you're actually, you know, doing a full a full set of physical activities on a daily basis is just a different outcome for you. I have a feeling that that's the case. Uh, so what I want to talk about is the so the issue of ventricular assist devices that can be used to support somebody if they're crashing after open heart surgery. This is post cardiac recovery. We're going to talk about bridge to transplant. You can have this bridge to recovery issue of having somebody who's got long-standing chronic chronic idiopathic, non-ischemic meaning there's no heart, there's no coronary disease, it's really just the heart failed for unclear reasons. And, and maybe try to condition the heart back to some, some, some sustainable level. I'm not saying you cure anything. <laughs> and the data that we have is only five, seven, eight years out, and some of these people are free of heart failure with this kind of approach, but some aren't. Um, I don't think you cure anything, these people are still on a lot of meds, but you give them a chance to reverse some of the heart failure and maybe live Long do without a transplant. This is a, this, I'm not going to talk much about this. Really, talk more about bridge to transplant. Destination therapy. We're not talking about tonight. Actually, this is a, a um, you know, a network for uh, gift of life for organ uh, transplant uh, focus. But I want you guys to know we're we're now really facing talk about how you kind of weigh uh, the benefits and the and the uh, losses if you transplant someone older. We do have pumps that are now kind of. You know, they're kind of uh, challenging. The survival statistics are kind of becoming closer to transplant. <laughs> so if these pumps are starting to be, in certain patients who can really, you know, take care of them and do well and have family and support and so if these pumps are beginning to be uh, palatable as long-term durable support devices, what is the justification for transplanting a 75-year-old? Are these internal or external? So these pumps are, I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna show you pictures right now. And by the way, just so we know, 
the percentage of patients that are being bridged with a left ventricular assist device, if you start looking at the history of, of uh, you know, the support devices, look at this growth. A third of patients, very stable, by the way. Still about 35% the last time this was actually looked at, you know, wise. But about a third of patients are now being routinely assisted with these devices to be bridged to transplant as a means of, uh, of, uh, of bringing them to transplant uh, in a more healthy manner or, or because they just needed the heavy implant. There was nothing more to do. That's more salvage. The other route is more like you plan the implant because you know that they have a higher likelihood of failing with the medicines than with the pump. And, and you make that trade-off with the patient. So the pumps are basically uh, getting smaller. This is the old style uh, pusher plate uh, pneumatic pump, meaning that you basically have a, a volume of blood goes into it through this inflow cannula, and then a volume of blood goes out you know, as you have a certain volume, a sensor clicks in, ejects blood. This is a continuous flow pump. This is what I'm really seeing in patients on clinic at, at, at Pennsylvania, at, at the University of Pennsylvania on Wednesdays in my clinic. These patients have a continuous rotor, a continuous rotor that basically unloads the heart and just, you know, in a continuous flow manner, takes blood and, and directs it in this direction in a, in a, in a laminar, uh, meaning that it's not turbulent, in a very laminar direction. And, um, and we're going to talk about the risks and some of the changes that, that we see when we put patients on these pumps. But this is, for example, a uh, example. Oh, this is one of the pumps, the HeartMate 2. This, uh, this pump sits basically just outside the heart space um, before the abdominal space, like right here. And blood is, is draining here. And again, the rotor is spinning about, in this case, 8,000 to 10,000 RPMs. It depends on the volume and how big this pump is and the reservoir what the RPMs are. But about 10 to 8, 10,000 RPMs, and then it's being, you know, driven with the pump back into the aorta. So, so, you're, so you're literally, you're unloading this heart that's, that's big and, and failing, and, and you're driving flow back to the body. Um, and again, this is if you, if you step back, so that's that. And then you have the system. So here is the um, here is the dry line which comes out of the body someplace. Now now we're out of the body. You know it comes out here or here. And now this is connected to a controller, which is but operated by batteries. And there you have it. So the dry line is about the size of my pinky, and the dry lines are getting smaller, which allows for these things to just you know get a bandage. That you that you dress daily and you change daily, and these people are supported with daily dressings. These batteries are now about, uh, the newer batteries about 12 hours, 8, 12 hours can last. Uh, currently, they're about um, anywhere from two to, four bat two to four hours, depending on the RPMs and the power needed. But that's the setup. And when you're at home, uh, you're connected to a um, PBU, a power base unit. Especially if you're in your bedroom, you can still be actually with your batteries. But if you're at home and your desk and so forth and don't need to be mobile, um, you can just be connected to a power base unit so that you don't need constant uh, battery. So the bridge to transplant, I just want to show this. Um, and then we should, you know, what I can do is basically then uh, talk briefly about recovery. Then we can just sit down and talk about what, what you guys think. Because, I mean, this will be, I think this is going to be, I'm not saying that because I'm the director of the program, by the way, with Dr. Morris. <laughs> not at all. I, I, I really believe every patient gets should get the best decision made individually, not because of your favoritism for one or other therapies. That's not, the doctor, that's not your role to favor anything. Your role is to make a decision for somebody and help them make that decision as well. But this experience is starting to become more and more efficacious, more, uh, there's starting to be a more uh, benefit to a larger number of patients. It gives you time to decide if someone's going to get better or not. If the kidneys can recover, so you can make a decision on whether they can be transplant eligible. That's a huge thing, because if you guess wrong and someone's on dialysis after transplant, it's not the end of the world, but it's not the ideal, right? I mean, someone still has to have three-day-a-week dialysis, um, and, uh, and a lot of times that's not reversible. So this study actually was trying to, was trying to figure out what the durability and the ability of this heart rate to this continuous flow pump to bring patients to transplant. The CAP is a continued access protocol, so the original trial turned 79 patients, and then there was an additional patients that were because of the ongoing analysis of the data set were beyond the end needed for the trial, 
can I get another patient into this? Can I get another patient? Because you know, because there was there was original success with being able to bridge these patients to um, and and uh, to transplant. And again, this was uh, this was uh, done at 32 sites, and, and, and University of Pennsylvania was one of these sites. And we had uh, I talked about the mean age. Look at the mean age in this trial. That's the mean age. There's the, the oldest patient was 69 and 70. Again, you had to be transplant eligible to get into this trial. You had to be somebody who could be listed for transplant and then bridged with the device to transplant. So these people were deemed transplant eligible at this age, which to answer the question of what, this is a current trial, which is just about uh, three, four years old. And, um, you know, because cause it's a smaller pump, there was an increasing number, before we, we, we had well under 15% women who were being supported with, with heart mates, with, with pumps. And, um, and now this, this is a higher number because it's a smaller pump that can, that can be implanted in a, in a person with a smaller thoracic cavity, uh, like, like a woman, uh, like a woman may have a smaller cavity than, than a man. And this is the breakdown of how they look otherwise in terms of their size. And, you know, again, they were all sick and stage needing transplant. And here's the survival in terms of both in the primary trial and the continuous access protocol, just so you guys understand uh, this was our, the, the, the end point here is you may need several months to get the transplant because you're a blood type O for example you got to wait until you get an organ available that matches your blood type and also matches your your uh, antigens that you've been sensitized to so but, but the data looked really good I mean to be able to be on a pump and have this kind of success on the pump and then finally be transplanted at some point this was uh, this was very nice I mean, I mean this was a very 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 telling at one year early success that, that we can do this way better than we were able to do it before. May I ask a question? Yeah. May I ask a question? Um, what is the youngest that you've ever done? Youngest patient. Youngest patient. So youngest, well, I'm talking like infant? Yes. Yeah. So it's a different uh, pump, the Berlin Heart. Right. And, um, you know, do you, and, do you still call it the back? Yes. Yes, the Berlin heart. So some of them are total artificial hearts, right. depending on the anatomy of the infant. A lot of times the infants are failing because of congenital heart disease that requires a lot more than just an assist device. Right. But if it is an assist device, um, some of these, uh, you know, uh, pediatric assist devices absolutely have been used to bridge patients. And you know what else? In the pediatric population, especially Arizona's leading this effort here in the states and in the Berlin group definitely has a lot of data on this. These younger patients who had a uh, congenital cardiomyopathy on these devices recovered their function. And they, they, you know, they're clearly trying to, I mean, a young patient, uh, the heart does grow with the baby, uh, a donor heart, we know that, you don't have to transplant them every three years and so forth. But uh, you can imagine a young baby needing to have a transplant. It's a great gift to have, but for how long? And, and what's gonna happen when they're 20? And so forth and so on. Um, so, so the good news is that uh, a lot of these patients are now being discovered. Not because they're looking, but they say, oh look, the heart looks way better. Well, let's turn the pump down. Oh my God, it's working way better. Turn out, take out the pump and see how the infant does. That's, that's what I think would be smart medicine in that case. But I'm not a pediatrician, by the way. <laughs> but I did, you know, when we go to the Gordon conferences that we attend to try to understand where the field is going, I'm going to tell you, the last one that we were at, in New Hampshire, there was a big pediatric uh, questioning about recovery. I mean, they were really, and before they were not at all wanting to go into this. Uh, but now they're seeing it as a reality that, that's, I think the newer pumps is allowing people to see this more than the older pumps. Um, just to give you guys a chance to see, so what's life like on this device? Number one, the six minute walk, which is a, a marker we have how somebody increases their ability to do more. This six minute walk is with CRT, these biventricular pacemakers that help the heart synchronize its function. That's a good distance. I like to see an increase of 50 meters. I'm not going to disperse CRT here because my colleagues put in these devices. But the VAD, clearly, I mean, when you take somebody who's a class four patient, cannot walk 10 meters really without stopping, potentially even, you know, short of breath at rest. You know, you're talking about a, a, a functional capacity increase that's pretty dramatic very, very early on, very often you see it, and sustained. And more importantly, clinical, uh, you know, all the quality of life measures that have been applied have really, again, you look at the, just, you know, you have a one month quality of life improvement um, 
And again, this is in the primary cohort, in the continuous access protocol. There's no control group here. We're just seeing we're just seeing the percent improvement in that same individual over time. And, and it's nice to see people say, you know, I'm continuing to see a quality of life improvement. And you can imagine, first they have to understand what it means to be on the bat. And as much teaching as you do before the implant, the reality comes after you've woken up with this device inside you. And, and you know, I can share with you patients a, a story of a patient we currently have. It's, it's very telling. It's very important. This is why it's so important in this era when this device is going to be used to help certain people not only live longer but live better lives. The patient has to be on board. The patient has to understand what it means to live on a device and more importantly, what it, the challenges and, and whether they want those. We had a patient who was so sick, elderly, he had heart failure for many, many, many years. 72. This device was put in him and that is a virtual transplant. It's just, you know, this is your device to do well and get better and do more. He did great. Unbelievable. The guy was just, but he was as afraid as you can imagine and we couldn't understand why. He didn't want to learn, change his batteries. He didn't want to do any of this. I, I had to, I, I mean, I had to go meet with him because and I'm the director, I just, I just said, what, I, I, I need to delve into this, and my colleague just didn't have time, the primary physician who took care of this. I, I was there for him with an hour, to an hour and a half speaking with him. He actually questioned the benefit of this device, and I said, I said to him, Mr. So-and-so, do you realize when I first met you, and I took care of him in the hospital, you couldn't talk without stopping after one sentence. You had to stop and catch your breath. You've been talking for an hour. <laughs> and, and you've been talking for an hour with wonderful poise, and I said, I know you've got a benefit. The question is, What's going on here? And he told me, he said, I'm afraid to death to let my family down because I don't think I wanted this. <laughs> and I can just tell you, it raises all kinds of questions, you know, to, again, to implant an older person who already had a plan if things didn't go well for him. That's, oh yeah, exactly. So I kind of had to take a deep breath. And me and Sal, the social worker, we had to just sort of say, we're gonna be here for another hour <laughs> talking about, you know, what we can do now. For this, for this wonderful man. And um, of course, it's a different question for transplant because these are patients that we obviously, they want a transplant. They, they want, they have specific goals in mind. They, they want, you know, family goals, work goals, life goals, whatever. They, 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 they need to uh, see more things through and so forth. But this is important, this quality of life, trust me. If that gentleman had, had, had filled out his, his, at his survey, I don't know if he did, he probably did it's a research protocol that he was still under. He would have given zeros for his quality of life on this. Zeros, you know, flunk, flunk, flunk. You know, he would have been on this uh, percentage. Yes. You just you just said a minute ago that the transplant patient wants the transplant. Yeah. What if the patient does not want this? Oh my God. They they need it. You know they need it, but they don't want it. You mean the assist device? Yeah. At the end of life. Exactly. Oh, I don't. What do you do at that point? Well, I think at that point you despite families, obvious, you know, if someone's competent and you really believe they're not because of their heart failure, unable to make a decision, especially, for example, if somebody a month ago makes a living will and says, I want everything done, you know, and, and this is what I, this is a person I want to designate as my decision maker, and then they don't, and, and maybe they're, maybe they're in a low output, they're, they're, they're you know, they're, they're failing too much from heart failure to even think clearly, you have to be a reason, you know, clinician to way to say, Let's have a family meeting with the patient there and try to sort out what we're going to do here. But I really believe that the patients who do the best are the ones that say, I've been reading about this assist device, we had a family meeting twice about this, and we think we're going to go through this. I mean, that, that's an outcome that I can already grasp. When there's ambivalence going into a surgery in an elderly person, I mean, I really feel like the family has to be allowed to be with that family member more in the hospital, but maybe the best thing is hospice. And palliation, in other words, you treat the symptoms of pain and heart failure, which we have good medicines for that, and they may actually outlive the expectations of any physician with that strategy, which is a blessing, because then they got what they wanted, and they're living longer. Um, but I really believe that uh, in this field, because I don't know if you guys have seen the news about this. You have probably seen some of the news about these devices. It was on uh, 16 Minutes, or I forget who Diane Sawyer works for now. But basically, uh, that show had a special on these uh, devices because of the recent FDA approval of this for destination therapy, first in the U.S., this device for that. Um, so that's huge implications for a lot of things. 
I'm sorry, um, so they have approved it? They have approved it. As of, Friday, uh, um, as of this past Friday. I want to mention the date for people watching this video. Right, the FDA has approved the HeartMate 2, and it's going to approve others. That's January uh, of 2010. Absolutely, as a, as a, as a what's called destination therapy. I don't like the name, but it's what it is. It's, it's therapy that you are... Uh, you know, destined to live with a device, basically. I mean, that is what you uh, what you choose when you when you go for this device. Um, if obviously complications come up with this device, you can always consider explanting and the risk benefit of explanting. But the idea is you're going to be on this device and um, for the rest of your life. Rest of your life. So um, in other words, true transplant is th at that point. Yes. Out of the question. That's exactly right. You you have already been evaluated because of reasons of other risks or reasons of age sometimes. Personal reasons too, by the way. If somebody tells you on these medicines, you may feel this, that, I say, I don't want that. <laughs> what else can I get? And then these pumps come up as, as an alternative. Some people actually have that as a, uh, as a, you know, as a belief that that's what they want. Now, I was yeah. going to ask you, in Europe, they were using this destination therapy, yes. and now I'm very pleased to hear that we finally got there. How long have they been using this destination therapy in other countries? So it was, again, these trials were needed to prove the point, but the European agencies often move a little quicker. Yeah. And um, I can tell you that in this case, <coughs> the, um, so in, in the case of the HeartMate 2, which is the first pump for destination therapy approved in the United States, and let me, let me just be clear, it's the first continuous flow pump. The, the previous generation, the big one that I showed, right. was approved by the FDA after one trial. That trial showed a benefit of being of being implanted, but the two-year survival of that pump was 24%. So survival. So most people were dead at two years. Right. The two-year survival of this pump, based on the most recent data, is closer to 60-62%. Oh, no. And so that that's and, and it's going to get better, we believe, as we understand the, the science of who to implant, and also as these pumps get smaller and they're fine-tuning how to match the human you know, the human pump. Uh, so, in Europe, I, I, you know, Europe things move a little, yeah. it's just the approval comes quicker. What's so the longest survivor on one of these? Yeah, about, there's, so I think there's about five, five and a half years. Yeah. Is, and, and again, and Thoratec, which is the company that actually makes this pump, but there, again, there's other companies that are coming up with their models. I'm just using that as the example, because that's what's been approved. There's a uh, ongoing pump that's basically, uh, you know, suspended in water. So it's a it's a it's a model that's been uh, continuously spinning, I think, without failure for about seven point seven years. And uh, yeah. So the fifty thousand dollar question is: Do they have to? Do, does the patient have to take anti-rejection medication? No. They don't have to take anti. No. no really? No. That, I mean, again, this is a pump that uh, has um, bearings and. There's still an interaction between the pump and the immune system, but there's no we don't we haven't learned that we have to antagonize or change that interaction for someone to do well. So the body doesn't realize that it's even there. No, no, I think the body does. We have a signal that it does because you guys have heard of these PRAs, these uh, panel reactive antibodies that you have to check. Uh, uh, probably it was checked in you, but there was no there was no issue. Um, these PRAs do come up, but the pump is implanted, which is an issue to try to get someone transplanted, but then these PRAs come up and then they come down. Uh, so we, we definitely think there's an interaction with the immune system. It's just that it does not have to be manipulated because the pump's life is, is based on its mechanical properties, not in anything that is wear and tear from the body's end of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, but let me ask you this question. And, yeah. and I have to ask. Are you suggesting that there's a possibility down the road, years down, that heart transplant as we know it will not exist any longer and they will be using No, those? gosh, not at all. No. I think transplantation, I have a slide that addresses that. Okay. Um, I think transplantation is the most viable and durable option for any end-stage heart failure patient, no question. Okay. And I am, again, I'm here as somebody who's trying to help understand the role of this technology in a medical center and also trying to explore the means of recovery with this pump. There is no question. I do believe transplant, there's a sweet spot for transplant in terms of, you know, because of the durability of the of the organ outlet itself, if you transplant a very, very young person who needs it, who needs it, it has to be realized what the what the half life of that organ, what the full what, what the expected life of that organ is. And and it's important to know that there is 
retransplantation. There's always in the ability to retransplant. Also the ability, hopefully down the line, for us to learn something about immunosuppression so we don't have to immunosuppress people as much. And they can live longer without cancers as a result of that immunosuppression and so forth, or infection. But at the end of the day, uh, transplant right now is the king of advanced therapy. Hands down. It is. And it's going to stay that way. What, what we believe, a lot of us that are trying to understand the role of this is, this has a role. And there are times when we are equipoise, meaning transplant and bands, it may be equivalent for a certain patient. Does that make sense? I mean, for the majority of patients, transplant is better. For certain patients, you may say, what if we put them on the cyst device and make sure their kidney function gets better before we commit to a heart that someone else could benefit? Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. the, the worst outcome is always seeing somebody who gets transplanted and dies, of course, within 30 days. At, or, or more importantly, um, you know, within a year. I mean, uh, or, or also as as as, as uh, not as tragic, but also as, as important for uh, you know, the medical centers and for the immunos people to have you know a death at one year. Um, why? Because you know the goal is to get people back. You know, we don't we don't want to keep people hospitalized for six months after transplanting. So, so that's always if the VAT allows you to know that and get someone more successfully to transplant and then live longer post-transplant, I think it's a therapy as a bridge to transplant. Um, you're asking harder questions about destination therapy. Sorry. At what point, no, 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 very good questions. At what point is it more, I can tell you, my surgeon, that I, my colleague who I work with has a firm belief that if you're older, that, because he wants to give that younger person that heart. Absolutely, I mean, the, 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 you know, you guys know this figure, 2200, 2400 per annum transplants in the U.S., that, that's been pretty fixed. I know this place is trying to, you know, increase the number of donors and, and so forth, but it's been pretty fixed for a good time, right? It's been mm -hmm. about five, six years. It hasn't like changed in five or six years either. So, so that's not going to change. And so now the question is how to optimize the survival of those people that get it. Um, this I just want to make sure you know. I mean, some people were listed as destination therapy patients in terms of getting this bad for the purpose of saying you're not transplant eligible, but all of a sudden the center says, but wait a minute, why didn't we have the non-candidates? Why did the 50-year-old get, oh, because their kidney function. Well, now their kidney function is normalized on the back, sometimes. Their pulmonary pressures are better on the back, so so they move forward with that. This is the heart rate, another one. I just want to show, um, I showed the heart rate too. This is another generation pump. I want you to know there's a little bit different technology because what this does is the bearings on the, the, the rotor, which actually you know spins and, and drives blood in a certain direction is levitated on magnets that are suspended. There is no contact of any bearings to support the rotor. What does that mean? The blood, so the blood really has, doesn't have to make contact with anything. And so this technology allows potentially to have less interaction with this interface, we've talked about that. And, and maybe even the wear and tear of the vat, this, this, this is supposed to be a more durable even, in theory. How long are, uh, the, the number I threw out there, Jim, about five and a half years on, on the heart rate, too. I mean, this is just one person. The other people have been transplanted, or some have died, uh, or some have had a, um, a reason to explant the bad, because the bad, I mean, there are, there are things that can go wrong with the LVAD, thrombosis, pump thrombosis, clot in the pump, and so forth, and so on. But there is somebody out there who's doing very well and, and is interested in only continuing with the heart rate to support it for about five and a half years. And I don't know the story of that person, I just know that number. And, and um, you obviously can't have 10 years survival on a pump that's only been out, you know. That's exactly right. right. Yeah, the right. experience is, you know, I only put these blanks to sort of say, enough talking, what are these guys thinking? Are they asleep? <laughs> Do they need a lunch, a lunch break? <laughs> a sun break? <laughs> or, uh, or if I don't know, I'm just joking. But, but if, you know, I, the, the last bit here is really, um, I just want to share with you guys with um, what the two slides here and then the last slides on recovery, what are these, I mean, what are the complications? I'm giving you the impression of this technology being helpful, now it's being evolved, but there's still complications of this technology. And anybody in this field is going to tell you we're still getting we're trying to get it right who's going to be walking out of the hospital in two weeks, like that patient I talked to about who's, who's you know, doing pretty well right now. Um, infection, bleeding, and remember, you're supporting the left heart, not the right, so you can't have right heart failure. And the, when someone walks out of the hospital with an assist device, we are supporting the left side primarily. When we talk about supporting the right and left side of the heart, both sides, 
we are talking about somebody who's going to be in the hospital much longer. We're talking about somebody who is doesn't just do as well. I mean, whenever he has, and, and, and it should make every sense to anybody that we just, if you support two organs, and it's for two part, two sides of the heart, the right and the left, this, you know, that patient's already sicker. You know, there's a reason for it. And so the outcomes are always, 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 uh, always worse. But, but this is a reality, and these feed off each other, by the way. So if you're in, if, if, you, if you are basically not going into that operation with a low risk of infection, what goes into that? Nutrition. If you're malnourished and heart failure has made you so thin and made you uh, cachectic, meaning that your body is, is thin, I mean, you look like you've been starving, but you haven't. And heart failure has been actually, you know, uh, driving your protein levels down. The patient, it, it's going to be a, it's going to be a battle, you know, and we, we still battle with that person, especially if they're young, to get them through it. We, we, we give them total parental nutrition, we give them we two feed them, I tell the patients who are on these two feeds, it's a steak dinner, trust me, it's a steak dinner. It doesn't look like one, it doesn't taste like one, but it's a steak dinner for tonight. And, and, and we give them every chance, every day, to, to, to get to a point where they're not going to die of infection on the lab. Because again, if you put in the pump and it works beautifully to support the patient, but the patient is too gone, too sick, well, what are we doing? You know, we're, we're not doing anything. Um, we've learned this the hard way. I'm going to tell you, there were patients implanted who were very advanced. And the result was not good. Um, so this has to be taken into account. Bleeding, again, when they're so sick because the liver is congested, the liver doesn't make the factors to clot, they bleed. And then you can't stop the bleed, and, and they don't live. Uh, and then right heart failure. Again, when you have a, um, a right heart that suddenly is asked to do more because the left heart supported, the right heart has to keep up with the left, it starts to fail. If you don't guess right, it's going to be tough. And, and that person is in and out of the hospital. So what have you done? Again, you're back to a, I hate to say it, to my colleagues who are in this field, you're back to a state of failure. Not left heart failure, you've solved that with the pump. It's the same for the patient. They still have to come into the hospital, get Lasix, and so forth and so on. So these are, this is the reality of failure with this pump. This is just to give you guys an idea, um, you know, the different variables as clinicians we look at, all these variables go into a, not an equation. And I all might say, Gosh, we're going to really find an uphill battle if we take this patient through surgery. Or the timing is right now. Are the patient, patient ready, family ready? Often the patient wants to wait longer. We have patients that say, I want to come back from the, uh, you know, the cold, but it's <laughs> spraying here, and then we'll get implanted because I want to take my time in, you know, in Arizona or Florida. And again, it's all an issue of timing how somebody does. So we often say, well, could you reconsider? Because you may not be a candidate in six months for this therapy. Uh, because you may be too sick. And, and that's all, it's a very important to be very upfront with patients about that. I know, um, I, yeah. excuse me, I know at the University of Pennsylvania, all the, all the cardiac people sit down on a Tuesday morning and have their meetings yeah. and evaluate each patient. Yes. Are you involved in those meetings? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm there every Tuesday. We talk about the patients that are on the assistive device, and now I have our meetings on Wednesday. We were, we were kind of trying to have a meeting in the aftermath of that listing meeting on Tuesday because they're so related. You know, you're bad as a bridge to transplant. Exactly. But you know what's happened? It's, it's too much to ask somebody to sit through an hour and a half to two. Okay. And, and, I, and, you know, we do it. I do it because I've been asked to direct the program. But at the end of the day, the ability to have a different day, and this is something that was motivated by our surgeon, Dr. Morris, who's the director of our program as well. I said, you know, Ro, we do need a separate day just to give us because we're having more candidates we have to give these people attention we can't just do everything in a half hour so we've got our own hour on wednesday morning so there's tuesday morning wednesday morning. who makes this on, on a tuesday morning meeting which is primarily they're looking at candidates yes. with true transplant yes. who makes the decision to shift them over to your department no we all we all do you uh, no, we're 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 all, we're all of us okay. all of us size up the chances somebody has to be transplanted successfully and if they're stable transplant let's wait until we can get an organ for them if they're unstable and shifting more into a state where the state. patient is basically just going week to week with the chance they're going to have a hospitalization we say let's put an assist device give them a chance to get stronger better recover physically recover and let the patient, some of them, I mean, I can tell you, share stories of my patients at UCSF. We had patients that went back to work in three weeks. I mean, they, financially, they had to. I mean, for them, the whole thought of being, there were young patients too, some of them, the whole thought of being bridged to transplant, they're like, how long is that going to take? I said, well, it could take six months. Oh, I can't. Oh, my, my apartment, my, my, I mean, so I was like, well, what's the other option? You know, and, and they were trying to understand that, uh, you know, 
they understood that a lot of the, you know, they were facing death, but they were also considering their, their loved ones. You know, how is that six months going to impact on those people, some kids' lives? And, you know, these were wonderful people. And one of them, it was a, um, was a manager, or I think he was a manager, I think he had a managerial position at Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's at first said, my God, you want us to take this patient with a bat? I said, absolutely. And then they took three patients. <laughs> so, so they took him, and they were very impressed with how productive he was, and then, you know, they used it as a, uh, you know, more of a public relations issue that we're, we're, we're taking these patients with an assistive device because they are productive. And uh, they gave two jobs to our other patients. So I can tell you that um, it was a decision based on with the patient what was best and the timing, the timing of when they could be transplanted. If someone's a blood type over a year and they don't have, and they're failing, it, it's, not a, it's, not a really, it's not a really tough decision at that time. You, you, you need to be having the surgery to be supported. If you're a blood type A or, or a blood type that allows you to come to transplant in a week or two, um, then, then the decision may be more straightforward. I just downloaded some pictures, some fun pictures that I saw. On the web. This is not someone I know, by the way. Uh, but I can tell you, I've heard stories when I've been with my colleagues um, about a patient. This is a patient who's got a heart made too. There's his belt. And I hope he's not an actor. Uh, I think he's a real patient who's actually, you know, probably working somewhere. I don't know where this is. Uh, but that's one picture I downloaded to show you guys. Um, here's a guy who's probably a destination therapy patient. I mean, I'm sure the coordinator is looking at this if they're I'm cringing. The one thing you can't do on a heart makes it so on a heart center or the other devices that are available is this, you know, you cannot go swimming. So you so you have you are connected to the device. So this guy hopefully is, you know, in very stable ground here, uh, water ground, uh, fishing, you know, with his uh, with his device. And um, so the recovery aspect of this, I'm just gonna spend a minute and then we can go ahead and keep keep discussing things. Uh, what we're talking about is when the heart needs to just be given a chance to rest for some time and with medicines. And we're talking about recovering the uh, heart, the kind of heart failure that is not due to coronary disease because coronary disease, if you have heart attacks from from, from coronary disease, scarring is, it's, the scar is, 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 is often uh, not replaced by, by heart cells. So scar is scar, it's hard to recover scar. So we're talking about non-ischemic, so non-coronary <coughs> failure. And this was, the, this was the first paper that basically gave us some hope. And the whole idea in England, and by the way, I came to visit, I went to visit Emma when, after our meeting in Paris, but in, in, actually in 2009, just, just in April of this year. Um, this guy, Sir, Sir Marty Yaku, felt like, you know, we can't transplant patients in England because we don't have enough hearts. The, if you think the donor heart issue here is uh, an issue, Japan, England, donor hearts are, you know, unbelievably precious, and most of the people on the heart transplant list die. There's just no question. So, so what was the, the challenge was save those hearts for the scarred hearts, <coughs> try to recover the non-ischemic hearts, and let those people live out longer until they are absolutely needing a transplant. Um, after they've gone through the strategy. And what was the strategy? Put a, put a heart made one, that was what was available at the time, and give them medicines, maximize their medicines. And what was the experience is, this is years after explantation, you take out, so you give them medicines, put up, put up, put, put in the system device, you rest the heart, take the vat out, but you only take the vat out after you've been assured by doing a turn down on the vat. You turn the VAD down to minimal support and you see what the heart does on its own on several occasions. You get reassurance from that. You take the VAD out and what happens is these people are without heart failure for a good number of years so far. And this is an ongoing experience that's being accumulated. But at least when this was published, these people were up to six years out. And what was going on with these people, the ejection fraction was coming up. And I met this patient here. Um, where is he? I think 288. I met this patient who, you know, 28 days on the VAD, his ejection fraction came up nicely with, with being rested and on the medicines. And this patient, basically, I met him when I was in England, and he'd been basically very sick pre-implant. In fact, he was hospitalized, very sick, uh, needed to have that urgent VAD put in. Uh, had had heart, he had heart failure for, for, for a good number of years prior to that. and. Um, Again, was a good candidate for transplant. He was 42 years old, 
Um, and then he had a, a optimization of his, uh, this is when I met him, and he was on, uh, again, explanted, he was explanted after 28 days uh, of mechanical support, no complications from getting the bat out, and this is what, when I met him, that was eight years later, the guy tells me he's doing everything he wants to, does not need Lasix, when he goes to a Chelsea football fan, when he goes to, um, when he goes to a, Football, you know, soccer match, and he's going crazy with the beer. That's when he's basically needing to uh, take LASIK split for that week. <laughs> but that's it. And this is eight years later. You have up there excellent candidate for one of the UK's prized parts. Because we're what are the numbers like over there? Oh, how many transplants a year? Right here in the States. I, gosh, Emma told me. I can tell you, in Japan, Japan you have worse. Japan, which is a culture of, of, of the donor issues as far as you know what they believe in, and, and donor organs. Um, oh, I, th I think in Japan it's under 100. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think in England it's, it's. Uh, I mean, I can just tell you, it's, uh, I'll tell you the statistic, about 75% of the patients on the transplant list die. Whereas our statistic is more like, you know, more like, we, we have about a 10% margin. 90% uh, people of our, our list survive. With well, some strategy. A lot of people in Japan travel to get their transplants. Yeah. Not get it in Japan. One experience I had at UCSF with a patient who basically had a very big, sick heart. Look at the size of that heart before the LVAD goes in. It shrinks the heart. And we started putting her, giving her medicines. Unfortunately, this lady ended up having, um, we had issues with having a family that could support her after, and, and whether there was going to be adequate support for transplant. Very worried. So she got better, and we explanted her. And on medicines and so forth, at least a year out, her rejection fraction is, is pretty normalized, 50%, and she's doing what she wants. Just an example of somebody who came in, 20, you know, came in as a candidate for transplant with a bad bridge. We lost family support halfway through. We, we just we couldn't really ethically transplant somebody without family support, uh, without, without some other way of, of, of finding a means for them to do well. We took out the bat, and she's taking her medicines and doing well. Just as an example of this. Um, well, that's the end of the talk. I just wanted to make sure that uh, you guys had a feel for the place of the assist device uh, in bridge to transplant, um, the different areas of bridge to transplant, bridge to recovery, bridge to decision, which in which I, I call it the uh, you know waffly. Uh, but, but there is a decision to be made on some patients, and we don't know, so we, we put a, a device in and we see if they are eligible for transplant later. And finally, um, we have the destination therapy. Thank you. One more fun picture. <laughs> this guy, I know for a fact, definitely is a bike rider. I don't care. It doesn't matter what the coordinators tell him. He's not going to give up his bike. <laughs> and he should. <laughs> oh, the yeah, coordinators are, you know, the coordinators have to live with, uh, you know, the calls at 3 a.m. Well, I got thrown off my vehicle, <laughs> and my van's disconnected. <laughs> so they often try to say, can we have a rule on the rules? They want to live, you know, I mean, yeah, we can have rules, of course, but talk to them, see if they want to hold the rules. But of course, we have some rules about driving and that and so forth. But after six months, I'll be honest, if you want to ride on a bike, and that's what your passion is, how can you tell somebody you should ride on a bike if you have a, an LVAD? I mean, it supports you, and uh, the likelihood of failure, acute failure, is, is probably the same as the likelihood of having an, a heart attack on the road and someone who doesn't have a bad, so you can't really justify it on the basis of saying, He's a liability to other people on the road, so you just gotta gotta live and, and see what happens. But how long can a patient be off of it? In other words, once it go, once it's implanted, and you just said, "Well, I fell off my bike and it got disconnected." Oh, very good question. No. Yeah. It depends on a few factors. It depends on whether or not that patient's native heart function is better, so they can That's what take over. Right. It also depends on whether or not the valve. Uh, one of the things that can happen with this device is the valve, which. Um, the its blood is ejected from the heart, the aortic valve, mm -hmm. it can get fused. Uh -huh. We don't understand how, but it can, very few patients can have, so if it gets fused, then it, you can't, the blood can't come out of here, and the pump stops because you're disconnected, blood pressure drops, they can, you know, they can lose pressure, and they can, they can, 
they can be unconscious and they can wake so up. So do you find that the longer, if it's a good patient, let's yeah. say, the longer the patient is on there, I'm assuming it can get it, it gets adjusted, correct? Yes. For force. So have you found that the longer the patient's on there, the heart can get better and you can adjust it so it's not pushing as hard because the yes. heart now is starting to... Yes, well, we call that weaning and we try to have the heart do more work if we're confident that somebody can actually maybe come off the pump. But I'm going to tell you it's something that's very poorly studied because we've had trials that have only been directed to get someone to transplant. And so if a transplant center is not like, like I mean, I, I, I went to visit Emma on my own volition. I wanted to see what this data in England was all about because I felt compelled as a transplant physician that there maybe was a place for having recovery in some of these younger patients or older patients depending on their, on, on, on their wish and more importantly depending on their candidacy for transplant. So maybe there's a role to give them a couple of years, five years, 10 years. Nobody knows. That data is young. It's one center so far and we've been trying to reproduce it amongst other centers. Some, similar recovery yeah. has, has occurred in, in uh, people that were transplanted uh, piggyback style. I think there was a girl transplanted around London. I think it would be fed to it. Uh, piggyback transplant on her old heart. Her transplanted heart failed after 10 years. They removed the transplanted heart and her heart was fine. So what this he's talking about here is sort of a domino, uh, a, you know, you can have a, uh, as opposed to orthotopic, our transplant, so you, you have to take the heart out, you can actually, uh, in series, have, you know, you, you kind of support the circulation with that. It, it, it may be very similar phenomenon, which you rest the heart and it starts to get better. Um, I believe part of this recovery business is because you're letting the heart rest, whereas, the heart is so congested and big, trying to support the body, because it, it, it's just the way it is. The way, the way its mechanics are, when it's failing, it's big. When you rest it in a manner that's decongested, the heart's smaller, that enough, that alone, I think, brings some recovery. The question, of course, is, is, it, is it enough recovery so you can take out the bad and they can do well? I mean, and they won't fail. Because, I mean, of course, one month is great, but what you really want is five years, at least. You want, as a person, to be given five years of of some certainty, some hope that you're going to be without a need for transplant during that time. Because do you have an age cutoff for destination therapy? Great. You're asking the hardest questions today. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, I can tell why she's a CEO or a. Uh, <laughs> I wish we did. <laughs> we don't. Okay. So I got to look to see. I got to look to see if the Medicare, the Medicare guidelines mm -hmm. for exclusion and inclusion. I want to see if age is one of them. I have a gut feeling they didn't go there. Um, I mean, you know, we live in a country where, unlike other countries, there's there's the absolute uh, hope for an individual to defy the odds, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, this country's built on that. So, I mean, I feel like in England, they have no qualms saying, you know, you would transplant a 60-year-old, would you? And the answer is, yes, we do. You know, we do, and we do it regularly, and they do well. And, uh, and it's just, you know, it's an issue of norms and an issue of... Uh, of culture, there's no question. And trust me, that culture is in that room on Tuesday mornings. <laughs> when we have those discussions about uh, what someone would and wouldn't do, I mean, my, my approach is always to prescind, to be very objective and just let, I mean, be very clear that everybody has uh, reasons to do things that are very individual. You know? So in the, in, in, the, in, the latest, in the latest mess that's been going on this past year with healthcare, oh God. And they talk about the quote death panels. Yes. This falls right into a yeah. situation like that. I think you're right. I mean, and let me just clarify what I think is is meant for this for this therapy. This is a therapy where very very soon there may be um, you know potentially limits depending on you know the power to have a insurance. Uh, you probably have an insurance sector that makes more than just you know business decisions to keep it. I mean, to, you know, if that insurance sector is making clinical decisions, imposing its will, there absolutely will be some some uh, some effects of this. What I counter is this: I counter on the fact that well, how many times do you want to hospitalize this individual that doesn't want to die, that wants to live, and is going to say no? Until the end. When? The very, very, very end. Nothing 
Short of that, I want, and and that's my will. You can hospitalize somebody monthly for that state chart failure. I mean, you guys know this. I mean, when you fail, you fail. The hospitalization, the number of hospitalizations it takes to probably meet the costs of this are probably no more than three or four. I would say maybe two or three. Yeah. And so a year, in one year. So I think that's where you got to say, and that's why the insurance companies are saying not because they're you know been, you know you know uh, uh, you know uh, benevolent and want what's best for the individual always. They're saying, oh yeah, put that device in. We cannot have <laughs> another year like this probably in that individual about in ten hospitalizations. That's going to you know he's an outlier already as far as our our estimated risk and so forth. So I really think the question is going to be. More competition in this field will hopefully drive the cost of these devices down. And the hospitals will be getting better and clinicians will get better at identifying patients that are out of the hospital in two to three weeks. We can't be absolutely right about everybody. But that is a hope, is that it's not putting a pump into somebody who's already, who's already not going to do it. You know, has, has another disease or has another state that you, you just can't, can't get them. Well, does that make sense? I mean, I think that's, and then I don't know, I don't know if the talks will get to that level. I have no idea. I try to turn out my TV. <laughs> Two questions. Play with my kids when I get home these days. <laughs> At this point in time, what does it cost for the LVAD itself, and what does it cost for the surgery in the follow-up hospital? Oh, I don't know that. I, don't, I should know that. Boy, she is. And then second question. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. These are wonderful. No, no, I, I can tell you a little bit of, of okay. I don't know the absolute. Um, right. The first question in terms of how much does the LVAD cost. Um, there is a, so the cost of the device itself, which is, by the way, a, there's a negotiation that goes on, I believe, with the medical center and the insurance company in terms of the, the per device. Because remember, some of these devices are on a shelf. Mm -hmm. So they're, there's a shelf life and so forth. So so the, the cost of the device itself, I think, is anywhere from, and this is the third generation, the second generation devices, the HeartMate 2, the hardware, uh, forty to $60,000. Mm -hmm. The operation itself, um, I don't know that cost actually. Mm -hmm. The real cost, honestly, to a medical center, the direct cost is how many days in the hospital does this patient have to be here mm -hmm. for you to be able to show that is good enough to go home or a rehab center so that you know, the, 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 those things are going into the equation. Yeah. So I don't know uh, the absolute number. And, and, and there's some good science in this. What happens is at all the heart, at all our meetings, our users meetings, or all our meetings at the conferences, I'm interested in the biology of recovery, I'm interested in, 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 in outcomes in these. Whenever we have somebody come talk about the reality of all this, you know, because we're trying to say, but the reality is what she's talking about. <laughs> I know, it's the least intended thing. It's probably the most important that we ought to know when we're trying to see where this is going. But I'll find out well, for you. There's another part to the, two more questions. Yeah. <laughs> when you do your, um, when the patient comes in to be avowed for a transplant, yes. do you at the same time evaluate them for <clears throat> candidacy for an LVAT and do you share that information for them when they come in to be evaluated Great for a question. transplant? So we have, it depends on the medical center and their ability to see how the LVAD is integrated into the transplant outcomes and how the LVAD can be, uh, remember some centers weren't even participating in these wish to transplant trials so they couldn't get that special heart made too for some of them, and some were. Um, so all these other VADs, the hardware and so forth. Uh, I'm talking about the next generation VADs. The previous generation VADs had an issue of, of long-term durability. Uh, the bigger bag, for example, you may have to switch two or three times in two years in some patients, just because of the durability of the valves and the and the whole issue of the bag itself. Um, our program currently is trying to use a similar model of transplant and that because you know it takes a will of the patient, a will of the family. You still want to have that support so that the patient can go home, which is where they're going to thrive. They're not going to thrive any, I don't care how beautiful any hospital is. You thrive at home. <laughs> the earlier you get home, you thrive. You guys all know that as patients, and it's true in just about any surgical procedure. The, the bottom line is that um, the decision is probably made with the patient obviously informed of a possibility of this at the time of listing me that 
we are hoping to bring this patient to transplant via a ventricular assist device. First, that surgery to let them get better, or, or because if we list them, we're just, we're just giving them kind of a, if you list somebody who's a blood type O, a certain weight class, and has enough antigens to avoid, if the chance less than one in 100 to get a transplant in a year, are you really, I mean, you put them on a list, they're like, yes, but, but what is the true, what is the true likelihood? I think that's what has to be conveyed. And it's conveyed at the time when the strategy into the patient of how they're going to be brought to transplant. So yes, it's integrated. Um, the woman in our program was wonderful. The coordinator, the pre-transplant coordinator, is absolutely talking to me as much as she's talking to my other colleagues about strategies to how someone's doing, how someone's failing, not failing, are they doing well, I'm knowing, are they not doing well. All those things are an ongoing, you know, ebb and flow of the decision making process. But in, that's why it would have been nice to be able to have these two meetings back to back because they're they're sort of but but it's it's too it's too hard at least in our program we're we're, we're going to have one on Tuesday one on Wednesday and we we'll try to still interface as clinicians about this. Can I ask a follow up on that yeah. question? Um, does the in, it does the insurance company ever turn a patient down because of dollars and cents? Well, I think what happens is this. To be fair to the insurance company. They look at the guidelines and they say, you're wanting to put an assist device in somebody who has cancer. For example, give me an example. Why? You know, the patient who has cancer has six months. What's the point? Mm -hmm. They actually bring a very valid point to the table, which is, have you talked to the patient about the odds that the cancer will be more likely mm -hmm. a reason for them not to do well than part of it? Very good point. But ultimately, of course, they're reasons for asking, like asking for any test approval is, is this medically necessary? And if it is, you know, prove it to me. So when the call takes place between a director of the insurance company and myself or someone else, the discussion is always about guidelines and rationale. And if the, if the paperwork unfortunately comes down to how you go ahead and, you know, you make an assessment and you give reasons, if there are reasons with lo with lo with some logic and, and, and some belief that there's medical necessity and indications currently accepted, because experimental stuff, I mean, look, it, it, it just depends on, we're always thinking outside the bag to try to save a patient's life. And, and it depends on the scenario, of course. If it's someone who's got a first insult, they were totally great, fine, walking in, with no other medical history, then, then that patient has to be uh, absolutely given every chance, outside the box, thinking to survive, when survival is on the line. I, I believe that, I think any person believes that. Um, when there's other issues, like that person has three or four morbidities, they're wheelchair bound, they're, um, they're, they, they, then it really does become an issue of what is a, you know, what is a medical rationale? Yeah, absolutely. And so I think to be fair to them, uh, that's the thinking, but I think the dollars and cents, I, I think they absolutely talk the trade-off, because they're, they're a company, I mean, that is. Does the insurance payment for, is it for a, a number of days in the hospital or is it for the heart transplant package? Yeah. Very interesting you raise that because we just had a, we're having meetings now of course to try to help optimize the issue of how to allow the hospital to do, to, to survive in terms of its ability to sustain the costs when there's going to be more candidates potentially for this therapy. And um, one of the things we found out is under the um, under the way that the current uh, Medicare guidelines and the insurance companies follow suit usually with this. For transplant is what you talk about. It's sort of a, uh, a it's called a global I think. Mm -hmm. It's all there and you, this is what you get and you you know you do everything under this global. For the assist device um, the expertise of seeing somebody daily in the hospital can be built for independently. And that's something that, so, so the days in the hospital, now the question of course, you, you ask for reimbursement and you bill, but you may not get anything. I mean, because that's what the insurance companies will decide upon. Um, so that's an important element because uh, then it becomes an issue of how the hospital is able to justify its building and all that stuff and so forth. But I don't, I actually don't know you know, like I said, I try to stay on the side of, you know, what's going to be best for this individual. And I really am a believer in having the clinicians, you know, they should be kept in the loop of how to make things better if the hospital has a strategy to do things 
um, better long term for it, but never at the cost of one individual patient's outcome. In other words, every individual patient gets gets counted, gets considered. I mean, I mean, there's no way that that, is, that, that will be compromised. And that alone is I'm directed here. Um, and, and I think at the end of the day, of course, the issue becomes uh, what the hospital does <laughs> to change its rules and what the insurance company do to put constraints on what we do. That came out when I tried to understand what was happening to hospital revenues when you allowed somebody to go home and wait for transplant. I thought they were losing money because they didn't have the revenue of somebody in the room. I said, no, we're being paid for the transplant, so they're not incurring the cost, but we're still getting the same money. Right. I thought, oh, wow, okay. And but it's different industry. in the bad world. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think so there's still, a, there, there's still a global, but it's, right. but, but there's also a component uh, in which you can, right. if you can justify why you're seeing a patient as a consultant, optimize this, mm. this device. Because of the device component, mm. there's a way that the hospital can actually probably build more than under the I'm assuming, I'm assuming that this is a major, major transplant city. Do you I'm finding that out? I just got here in September. I'm okay. Do you have you talked? are fun. Jim will have to fill me in on more. Do you talk? Do okay. you talk to your colleagues at say, Hahnemann, Jefferson, mm -hmm. Temple? I mean, do you also? Not as much as I would like to. I'm going to tell you. I think. I think we're going to. Ho I hope. And again, to give you an idea, of flavor for this. A lot of our team at at Hub at the University of Pennsylvania came from some of these other centers. Mm -hmm. Yes. And. And I believe very strongly, because it's again about the health of the patient. That's what matters to anybody. That's that's what has to matter. I, I believe in, in in a lot of cross fertilization of ideas, sharing experiences, and more importantly, sharing resources. So, so give an example. If one center likes to take, this is what I'm hoping to do in the next. I'm hoping in the next ten years to have a citywide, very close knit intact program that for these assist devices, like there should be for the transplant as well. Well, competition is like just something you talk about over a beer, but also what really matters is you you want the patient to have access to the best adjunctive and ancillary services for that for that advanced therapy. To give an example, rehab, cardiac rehab after VAD. Remember, I talked about how the heart we want the heart to recover in some cases. Well, it'd be nice if the, could, they could exercise under supervised conditions of cardiac. Rehab. It is hard to find a cardiac rehab program that says, oh my God, isn't that the kind of assist device? I didn't tell you guys about this, but on this assist device, because it's continuous rotor, some people, you can't you can't feel a pulse. Right. It's not pulse time. Are they not and, trained? So they're not trained. To, to and so the training, and so, so it's not that they're afraid. So they're not they're, trained. They're not trained. So there's a training aspect. So wouldn't it be nice if you had a center that says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take ownership of this. I'm going to try to do this for the patient citywide. And, uh, and be good at it. And you can send the patients to me. And uh, so that's what we're hoping to do for, for, this, um, for this kind of aspect uh, of care. Are you all on the same page now? No, gosh, I don't even, I mean, you're asking me as someone who just got here in September, I mean, all this, I, I'm still, I'm just learning. I can tell you politics. on the liver side of it, they're not. That's a oh, shame. It's competition. It's, it's business. business. <laughs> it probably is true for the heart, so we just can't see it. It's a business. It's a business. Yeah. It's you guys should invite Dr. Goldberg and Dr. Jessup. I'm sure uh, they would tell you a lot more. They've had a history in this city that, that I have. Well, we certainly had Dr. Eisen in here, and he, he goes back to when he was at Penn, then yeah. he transferred to Temple, and he replaced them over at Hahnemann when they went to, right. you know, so there's been a marriage around here over the past 20 years, right, right. and most patients who've been around long enough know that, and they're, you know, they know each other, and there's been a lot of hard, uh, hard feelings about stealing patients when you move to another hospital. Exactly. You know, hey, that's your that's your guy you trust. You go with him. And it's okay as long as they're coming to Hup when you go to Hup, but it's not okay when they're going to Temple when they're leaving. You know. And some of it, it revolves around your insurance provider as well. I mean, some I get calls all the time from people that. Or, you know, their doctors told them they need a liver transplant. And the first question I ask them is, well, I can give you a list of transplant centers in the city, but when you call, ask them if they accept your insurance, first and foremost. Because if you have an evaluation at Einstein, and they say, we're not going to list you, and then you want to go to Hahnemann, 
you have to have all those tests done again. They will not transfer those records to the other hospital. So now your insurance is paying for all those evaluation studies again. Why is it that they're not, why is it that they won't? I have no idea what I just well, know. Typically, the receiving hospital doesn't want the records from over there. They want their own tests. They want their own tests. Right. So, so right. it's for yeah. liability. Yeah. And they could come from an outside diagnostic center, and they still won't accept them. You know, so there's a, there's so many variables connected to that. And it depends on how strong the program is and how many, what their record is as to whether or not they're trying to build their program. So there's two in the city right now on the liver side of things. They'll take any patient that anybody else turns down so they can just, build just their numbers. Build your numbers. You know? Well, they need so, to get the numbers up to get their certification. Yeah, so if exactly. they can't get the patients, they can't get the numbers up, they can't have the program. So, so when you have a patient saying, you know, if I can I qualify if this and this and this, maybe not at the big program, but maybe the startup program. Right. Now, is the risk more in that program? Well, certainly. You know, they've been doing hundreds. This one's got ten under the belt so far. But guess what? They don't want you. This won't do it. And then the other thing is, you can go on the unit's website and you can look at the statistics all you want. But the key is, what doctor was there at the time of those statistics? Because that doctor may not be there. They may be here now. And they take the whole team with them. You know. So it's it's a whole fascinating world. Well, I started at Temple, was evaluated at Temple. My insurance company told me I had to move. And I had a choice between Harmon and um, Penn. And my doctor, who's now at Penn, Dr. Wall, said Penn. <laughs> 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 so, but. Uh, I want to tell Joyce she's so partisan. I just. I'm going to tell for four months right now. I am. Uh, <laughs> Tomorrow morning, I'm walking in her office and said, I met a lovely lady who so said, you would. This, this well, all right, told her, all right, here we go, can't decide. A worldwide athlete. Yeah. <laughs> but see, remember, it's not like that in most cities. No. no. Yeah, it's we're, we're like, like, so densely populated with transplant here. We don't get that concept no. that if you move to Wisconsin, you don't have a choice exactly. but one center. Exactly. You know? Or well, maybe two if you're lucky. What do you find? I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be... What do you find the biggest difference between coming from yeah, and coming here to Penn? And what made you come to Penn? What made me come to Penn? Yeah, so I, let's get down to that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what made you come to Penn? You know, I had an opportunity to help grow a program in San Francisco with both um, the assistive devices as bridge to transplant decision and so forth and, and recovery. And for me, even before there was economic crises in the state of California, which absolutely impacts every every program, especially from the University of California. But even before that, there's been a recruitment process for helping direct this program here at Penn, which has a wonderful, rich history in life. Um, the real driver for me was that, number one, my roommate from med school, Tommy Coppola, was here. Okay. A mentor of mine from Texas, Dan Dries, was here. Same team, same small oh, nine. So I'm the ninth of eight, and I knew, I knew four of those eight. Oh wow! And they were friends. Oh. And so for me, it was an issue of I said, you know, if I were to ask for a team of colleagues that I could be very honest about the limits of, for example, the chance to recover patients that are young with MSK chart failure, you know, just the whole issue of, of, of being nurtured and nurturing. I thought this team was just amazing. And I really did. I visited once and I told my wife, Liz, I said, this is it. Now, she wanted to move. <laughs> I mean, the second thing is, I love San Francisco. We both love it. But, you know, we loved it when we were single for four weeks in San Francisco. <laughs> I mean, single, we were uh, uh, without, married without children. Then our, our daughter came here about a month later <laughs> when we moved. And then life changed. And uh, our son Nicholas came to an half years. Life changed. Alexander came one month before we after we landed here, <laughs> very str strangely in life changed. So, so the thought was all also about how to, uh, you know, have a family life where, where it was feasible for us. And that, that decision was already in the works. I mean, we, we knew probably within a year or two of getting there that short of me changing career paths and doing private practice and not teaching and so forth, you know, we were going to have to make some tough decisions. And she still misses the sunset, and so do I. <laughs> I like the sunrises here a lot, Bobby. <laughs> and they blind me on the way up. You know, I'm driving, I'm like, I hope they don't drive further. 
It's a different, it's still a beautiful sun, but I can tell you the, uh, the, the team here and the opportunity here to really, 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 just really figure out where this therapy is going for uh, recovery especially is, is an opportunity I wouldn't have had uh, probably for years in San Francisco. I mean, I could have built it, you know. If you build it, it will come. I only believe that no matter how small, how, how big you are, you, but but the, the, the opportunity here was just too, and, and my, all my colleagues in San Francisco, this is when I knew, when they said, you'd be crazy not to leave. You know, I mean, that's when I knew also that uh, really good opportunity that we really, you know, it was gonna have to happen. Staying close to that subject, we've often said that Philadelphia is unique. It's got 43 transplant programs, counting the outlying Hershey, et cetera. Is, in your broader experience, is there any place in the United States that comes close to it? I think it's notorious. Okay, so we're, I mean, the history of we're not lying when we say that. The history of this city with respect to transplant is, is unbelievable. We yeah. all knew it, know it as transplant physicians. I didn't appreciate it until I saw how many of my colleagues have been in other places. <laughs> but it ha I mean, just part of the issue is the odds are, because there's so many programs that there's going to be cross fertilization training, you know, leaving coming and, and hard feelings and good feelings and so forth. But I think it's a plus. I, I really, I mean, I can tell you talking to a physician in, in uh, at Penn State who was caring for a patient that I evaluated as a second opinion, it was great to talk to him. I mean, he was actually a Hopkins fellow as well. He was, I didn't know that, so that's where I trained. But uh, it's a plus to have, I mean, it, for a patient, it's a huge plus. Because if you don't believe what you're being told, Go a second opinion is not on your, and you don't have to go travel. We had to go send our patients. When I told my patients that I felt they weren't good candidates, but they should have a second opinion, because we didn't have all the wisdom, and they should have a second opinion. I'd send them to Portland, Seattle, Stanford sometimes, but I knew Stanford would have shared the same sentiment as me, so I, I sent them a visit at the Stanford. I would have sent them to a, or to LA. You know, those, you know, those, that, that was an hour's flight. Hour and a half hours left San Francisco. I mean, here you can walk. You, you could <laughs> get the subway <laughs> and get a very different opinion depending on, like you said, the, the numbers that they need, and more importantly, maybe their styles. Maybe they're more aggressive. They're building, or they're more conservative because they're older. Mm -hmm. So they'll take an alcoholic liver candidate, or versus someone else won't, or, yeah. or you know. It's interesting because in a, a temple. There was a doctor there who was known as the cowboy. You you were that extreme case that nobody else wanted you. He wanted you because he could do it. <laughs> and for the longest time, he was renowned surgeon. God love him. He <laughs> we, we had a close friend that had all their organs reversed, you know. Yeah. And he said, oh, he loved it. He's still in touch with. Him. He's out in Chicago now. But uh, he loves those kind of challenges. Well, if you couldn't get another son to treat you, go see him. That's wonderful. That kind of thing. And also the other thing that. We often tell patients, I'm speaking for myself, but I know we all do it, and that is, hey, you, if you go in there and you don't feel comfortable with that particular one, go across town. You know, there's four different personalities that you're gonna deal with. Get one you're comfortable with because you're putting your life in their hands. And so it's not how good they are, it's how comfortable you feel with them. Or again, be, be clear that the majority of physicians have to have, you know, a certain type of, um, you know, I mean, I call it because of where I came from, from Hopkins, you know, equanimitas is sort of a state where you're, you're you're concerned, but not emotionally involved. It's very important for a physician to have that. And 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 so it, if you're not comfortable, just tell the physician, I want another doctor if it's okay within the group. And they should be absolutely comfortable yeah. to refer you. That, that's a very important, very important element of, of being a doctor is feeling that. And if they're not, they do go to another program. That program's not mature. We've often said, you don't have a hard problem filling out this place to be, right? Exactly. Because we got so much here. But then again, you have Philadelphia Inquirer a number of years ago running a very big article about are there too many transplant centers? Is it, you know, detrimental to have so much competition? It's an interesting question. Yeah, they didn't couldn't come up with the answer, and I don't think it's ever been answered. <laughs> but interesting question. Well, anybody else? Doctor, thank you very much. Thank you.